Welcome back to the Jellyhead Podcast. Today's Jellyhead Podcast is filmed in front of a live studio audience. We have no idea why. Laugh track. Look at that. <laughs> this is what happens when we don't book well. Just kidding. What's up, John? What's cracking, dude? We're here with John Lares of Cielo Agency. Yeah. Is it Cielo Talent Agency or is it Cielo Agency? Whatever's clever. Well, yeah, that's tight. Yeah. Well, I think we're done here, dude. All right. <laughs> uh, I met you. Mm. Um, where did I meet you? I meet. I met you at Eclectic Roots. Damn. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the the Mystic Mountain. One, yeah. That was cool. And you came up with me all this business talk, and like oh, you were like, "Yo, dude, don't sign that contract with PJ. He's a fucking fool." Dang. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think we had that conversation there. Yeah, we did. We did. I yeah. was kind of fucked up. Yeah, was so okay. was I. Okay. I had I was hung. I hadn't slept. I want to see Auto Lux the night before the Constellation Room, and I was shit faced. I was running on three hours of sleep. Fucking drove two hours in traffic. Yeah. Got up there, spent the whole day hammered. What were we talking about? Missing mountain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's tight. Yeah. <laughs> what are you up to now, dude? I haven't talked to you in like over a year. What am I up to now? I'm up to Jack. I'm doing this. Yeah. It's fun. It's cool. We're still playing musics. Uh, PJ's in the band now, actually. Oh. Yeah. We, the band lost a lot of weight. I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's how that's going. <laughs> so I want to get to know you a little bit. I feel like we've talked, but we've only talked business stuff. And I feel really bad because I remember at the time, so I met you and we were talking about stuff and you were kind of telling me what you were all about, what you were starting up. I think that's when you're kind of just starting everything. Yeah. And, um, and then you're like, oh, I'll go check out your band and stuff. And you came to see us at some place that Mike booked us at in, yeah. <laughs> in Fullerton. In Fullerton. And it yeah. was our worst show. Really? It was <laughs> legit our worst show. Because we had to bring all of our own equipment. The PA, too. We I had think. to bring the PA, and we had to work down. Some guys like some guys are like, oh, we'll help you out. And then they just didn't. <laughs> like, shit, just I couldn't hear myself on the monitors. I don't know how it happens, but my fucking synth got out of tune and shit. It was fucking weird. I was like, how does a synth get out of it? It's a computer. Nah, anyway. It was fucking dumb. But it was tight that you showed up, and I appreciate it. Yeah, dude. I think yeah. you guys actually sounded pretty good. Oh, thanks, bro. Yeah. You don't have to say that just because yeah. the camera's right here. Sorry. No, I think you did. Kind of oh, stupid. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about you. I don't really know too much about you. Like mm -hmm. you and I have never sat down and have had a solid conversation. So I was really looking forward to this. I just know that Brandon knew you first. Yeah. Yeah. I met, yeah. I met Brandon at school. At, right? at school. Yeah. Um, I don't want to talk about Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> We're all disappointed in Brandon, yeah, but it's okay. Yeah, Brandon. <laughs> me too. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, Mystic Mountain, I, I don't even think I signed any bands when I went up there. I think mm -hmm. I was just kind of like, barely met moon ensemble and uh, that was two years ago uh, Shit, that was two years ago yeah and uh now i mean a lot has changed since then i think so yeah man you've done a lot i've seen you you're working with artists um the big one that i was like wanting to ask you about i was like you you got an artist to like go on tour or open up with third eye blind oh yeah yeah well that story i mean she already the artist uh, emily afton she knows the lead singer for third eye blind lucky and so i think they just they were playing in san francisco and they're like hey do you want to open for us and uh, that's how that happened and you just took credit for it yeah oh, so right, right. That's, that's, yeah. That's i mean anything <laughs> <laughs> i was like yeah i mean but and the crazy thing is that like you th you have those opportunities and everyone outside is looking in and they're like damn you're fucking opening for third eye blind but when you're like at the venue they're in their own room you never get to see them you know they just like all right clear the room for their sound check and like no one can be in here okay everyone shut the fuck up you need to stop your sound check because they want to do an interview with who the fuck knows and yeah. so it's just kind of like all right this is cool but it's just clout it's yeah. not really like a real personal experience to meet a band like that it's just like oh you opened up for this act and that's kind of how it is probably unless you go on tour with them yeah then i'm sure you're saying the sharing a van and all that it's a different yeah. experience but when you're playing opening for a show 
maybe every band every band is different but for them it was yeah i think the guy from third eye blind was great in that steel dragon cover band i didn't even know he was in a cover band well, he was in that movie rockstar <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> I'm just looking at Brandon because he looks so cute right now. But I know. I know. His I'm, I'm his legs, like, legs are right open, now. dude. Like I'm he's got the Robert Plant bulge right this, now. Uh, like, <laughs> this is an open cast audition. Yeah, straight up casting couch. Something I'm not too familiar with. <laughs> oh, <it's a> little... <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so yeah, dude, you started like it. It seemed like you were kind of just going right out of the fucking gate. Like you had your fucking vision and you made it fucking happen. You did that thing at Lot Six One Three. What yeah. was that called again? The show. Honestly, it wasn't. I didn't have a name for it. I just had uh, one of my favorite DJs headlining it. It was uh, Flaming Osis, and um, I don't even. I honestly, I was so oblivious to like the scene, any scene i just like listen to his music on soundcloud and i hit up his agent and luckily he's like oh yeah we're gonna be i actually originally reached out to him to play a show in september he's like well we're gonna be in la in december can you make anything cool happen and i'm kind of at that point i think i've only thrown like one major show and that was my senior project at the glass house nice. um and so i was like yeah i can do that for sure like you know and i was like all right fucking i reached out to like ace hotel i reached out to like 15 fucking venues in LA like everyone under the every single one that you can think of and then all of them none of them responded back like the only one that responded back was Ace Hotel and he's like nah <laughs> he's like nah he's like, who the fuck like, are you <laughs> yeah pretty much he's like nah so then I'm like lot 613 cool and th at, honestly that venue is just like alright well this is the down payment is the deposit and yeah. you can control the event however the fuck you want but we want our money so yeah pay up and you know and then just got to curate it from scratch and since it was such a big space i was able to in integrate like art visual artists and working with moon ensemble and going to eclectic groups actually influenced that event a lot because i got it i make you know smitty and you know, david howler and all the you know all the artists the rad so, pro dudes and yeah and so i kind of brought them there and then i don't know why i think i, I was trying to like even outdo myself and bring in like nintendo 64 consoles with like tvs and shit nice. and so that was, that was a little extra but but that's yeah. what it takes though i mean because we were talking to we were talking to justin saunders earlier mm -hmm. uh is it saunders or sanders sanders, sanders whatever the fuck he's saunders. cute regardless <laughs> but we're talking to him and just like you know so many things like everyone wants to throw shows yeah. You know, but not everybody knows what it takes to do it. And then when they do do it, like you get a lot of promoters like, oh, we're just going to fucking book a band or a few bands. That's the bill. We're going to make the flyer, make the Facebook event page. And that's as far as that goes. Yeah. But it's like people kind of like that's what every show is like. That's what every local show is like. This is why they fucking just kind of like they get they, lost in, yeah. in, in all the shit. It's like you got to do something a little bit extra. Yeah. You know, to make it an experience. Yeah. The, hard, the hardest part for me is not... Uh, I feel like a few promoters just kind of came up, just kind of like me, um, booking like similar lineups. So I, the challenge for me now is curating like lineups that make sense and flow, but at the same time isn't something that you're like, okay, we've seen this 25 times already. Yeah. You know? Like that's the hard thing to do. Yeah. Especially when you have 25 bounds, it's not exactly the same these days. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I'm just I'm just a dick. Like I'll, I just talk shit on everything that I'm not uh, that I'm excluded from. So, um, <laughs> with all I mean, how did you? So, what did you go to school for exactly? Because you said your senior project, you threw a show at the Glass House. Yeah, so I went to school to be a producer, a music producer. Uh, so I majored in music, and then you had to choose three sub areas or one sub area focus. And so I chose industry studies. Um, and yeah, that story was basically, I went into school, they're like, so what instrument do you play? You know, orientation. And I, I came from a DJ background. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, uh, turntables. And she looks at me, she's like, she, she's so like, I said, what, uh, instrument, so do what instrument do you play? <laughs> and I'm like, piano? She's like, okay, next. Like, what instrument do you play? You know? And so I'm just like, fuck, I'm going to have to learn how to play the piano. <laughs> <laughs> Fake it till you make it. Yeah. So, well, I mean, after going through the program, seeing like all these musicians that are been playing since they're kids and i'm here like fuck i got like nine months of music lessons 
um, actual music lessons. I'm like, fuck, I need a. I picked up the slack and practiced like hell, you know, four or six hours a day on the piano. And then even that wasn't enough, I felt. Or I probably, you know, I think it was just limiting beliefs, but uh, a couple of professors encouraged me to take a business approach. And so I just kind of went full throttle. I was like, well, fuck, I can't just get this degree and do nothing with it. So. No. I was fucking no. I remember this class, uh, careers in music, and the professor was just going through all the different types of careers and professions in the music industry. And no one, every like, as soon as we came across like agent, like the chapter was like agents or booking agents. Like there was nothing but negative things that the professor said about that, and no one wanted to be a booking agent. So I was like, all right, well, seems like there's no not much competition there. <laughs> True. <laughs> so I gave it a shot and found out that I liked it. And so I just stuck with it. That's cool. Yeah. That's fucking sick. I mean, how do you, <clears throat> one thing I always, I always talk to PJ about cause he did the whole, you know, industry studies, music business and all that stuff. It's like, it's something that I feel just on a talking shit kind of background. It's like, it, it kind of almost seems like a bogus class just because it's like the industry changes every fucking day. It does. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's kind of hard to learn. It's, it's nice to learn one way of doing it. That's fine. But it's like, you know, the, the fucking curriculum is already three years old. That's why I don't think that like getting an education in music business is bogus. I think that the curriculum is bogus and outdated, mm -hmm. you know, and every, you got to take every curriculum as its own. I feel like if I developed a booking curriculum, I think I could do a pretty decent job. Yeah. At like even like a five week class or some bullshit, you know, and give people in like data on venues and like what people are looking for and things like that and experience, I guess, and my what I've gone through in the past couple of years. And I think that would be somewhat valuable. But what I experienced in the music like department wasn't anywhere near what I experienced in the past two years. I, I mean, how do you feel like it helped you, though? Um, I think more so than anything, understand um how how hard musicians work you know more it wasn't even industry it was just practicing really you know the expectations of being a musician more than uh, the expectations of working in the music industry so I, and as far as like how it helped me in the music industry i <laughs> you, know, say, like, exactly. not, you know nothing so but. everyone who's taking <laughs> music <laughs> business <laughs> right now <laughs> Just find another major, dude. <laughs> it's not going to help you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but it's good to have that perspective at the same time, especially as a booker, because I feel like there's so many people, there's a lot of people, and I won't name names. No, I won't name names. But like, no, it's fine. No. Uh, there's a lot of fucking people who, who will book shows and all that stuff, and they really don't understand the work that goes into you know, just the, these bands, you know, writing their music, finding their sound and all that stuff, you know, how hard they work at their instruments. And I'm not saying all of them do because a lot of them don't. A lot of them are just like, oh, I'm going to pick up a guitar and I'm going to get blowjobs. That's tight. And then that's fucking <laughs> the extent of that. Yeah. Like Brandon, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's honest. Uh, you know, so it's like there's, but I mean, Brandon does work really hard. He posts his little... <laughs> You don't have to work for that. Uh, I see you yeah. over there just fucking like, I learned how to play a concerto today on my acoustic. And it's like, that's adorable. Um, but no, it's like, so, I mean, I think that that's a valuable perspective to see how hard, you know, musicians work because I feel like it goes underappreciated from the booker side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, more so than like the promoter side, I think for me yeah. as I started out, people thought I was a promoter. You know, they're like, mm. oh, this guy's just, CLO is a promoting agency. You know, they just promote shows. And that's something I've been working at recently to avoid getting that stigma. Because I, I don't want to, I do want to curate shows, but I don't want to be labeled a promoter. Yeah. That's not what my goal is or intention. Because it's kind of a bad word. <laughs> Promoter's kind of a bad word. Right. It's like, because it's like, it's a, it's a huge title that actually doesn't really... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't like you would think promoting there's a lot of stuff out there man it's like there's a lot of people out there that consider themselves promoters and it's like really what are you doing you're relying on your on the fan base of a band right, right. as opposed to actually trying to curate a good show as opposed to trying to like 
make an experience for the consumer, the, the audience, or whatever the fuck yeah. you know. It's like, and that's something that's so fucking overlooked. Yeah. I mean, in your experience with everything that's been going on, everything that you've been a part of, I mean, what are some of the things that you've seen just on the outside versus what you try to bring to the table? Like, what are some of the differences you're trying to make? Um, I think uh, bringing bands outside of a radius of like, cause, you know, I think I, what someone would consider a scene is just a group of bands that play frequently within a certain radius. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to bring is other bands from other cities and mix them in, create like a connect two cities. So let's say like San Diego or San Francisco and let's say Pomona or LA, you know, and, and mixing in kind of increasing the radius, increasing this community. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, it's the production value. You know why people think why people go to festivals is because there's massive production behind it. So if you can create um, a good production and maybe a small intimate space with quality talent, and maybe even invite the I think even the people that come to the show also add to what the show experience is like. You know it's kind of curated from A to Z. You have to think about all those facets. Yeah. So I think with me it's just adding production constantly and making the life easier on the musician so providing backline you know providing information way in advance and following up and things like that paying the musicians in advance before they go on stage and instead of waiting till 2 a.m to wait for the bar to write you your check mm -hmm. and things like that so just creating an experience for the audience and for the musicians and for the venue too making everybody's life easier and i guess you know being creative in that process that's really what I'm trying to do. That kind of becomes a scary thing, paying the musicians uh, the musicians in advance. I mean, that's what we were talking to Justin about, because a lot of people, they will ask for that stuff in advance. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them are asking it like, oh, the day you get booked. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you're just like, full, I'm going to pay you and you're not going to show up and all that shit. Yeah, I don't do that. Like, even yeah. with big booking agencies, a lot of them require 10. Well, some big booking agencies want 50% down if it's the first time they've been working with you. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's 10% deposit. Um, that's because in their experience, the promoters are the ones that are like, oh, Stiff them. you know, yeah. The, well, not even that. I think promoters will book the bands and be like, yeah, I can pay you a thousand dollars. No problem. And then the promoter didn't really lock in the venue. And mm -hmm. so like two weeks later, oh, and uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, I didn't confirm with the venue that we were going to have a show on this day. And so the, you know, the booker is like, what the fuck? Like we didn't, we didn't book other shows because we agreed to yours and now you you being unprofessional and you didn't confirm it yeah so i can see on both sides but what i mean by paying it artists in advance i mean like they set up on stage and right before they go on you're like here's your payment enjoy yeah. your good show have a good show yeah you know things like that but paying in advance they use uh, yeah i don't do that anymore <laughs> <laughs> i've done that a couple of times but i don't do that anymore for a good reason i assume <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's hard it's hard to i think to, i mean the the truth of it is is it's hard sometimes to trust bands <laughs> it just is because you know like i said there there are those there are musicians out there that like they're working hard at something you know when they're up there or when they're writing their songs it's about something that's going on with them you know it's very personal it's very introspective and all that stuff but you don't get a lot of that especially in local scenes you know yeah. you get a lot of uh, when's the party mode you know you you have people who show up late to shows and show up fucked up or whatever it's like yeah i think if the promoter the booker the promoter does their research and you kind of look at the band you know you're not just watching them play music you're watching them as human beings and you're like okay what kind of person is this yeah. if you do if you go to enough of their shows you can kind of get a vibe of what kind of person they are mm -hmm. and if you go to shows and you see that this band supposed to play from 10 to 10 30 as advertised and they play till 11 15 and they don't give a fuck that they just went 45 minutes over their set time and you book them expecting different results well that's kind of your fault yeah you know it's so a lot of maybe a lot of promoters are just booking bands because they see them on instagram flyers and they're like oh well you know clout you know let's just book them too yeah. you know but they're not they don't really know them personally yeah legit i mean a lot of people they're a lot of people won't even research. It's like they look at their Instagrams like, how many followers do you have? Okay, yeah, I'll book this person. Right. Because I know you can get some sort of a draw without really thinking like you can have 3,000 plus Instagram followers, but that doesn't mean that 3,000 people are going to show up to your fucking right. show. Right. You're going to get like... <laughs> 
Half of them are from Thailand. Exactly. <laughs> and half of them are, are fake bot profiles, yeah. you know? So it's like they, they see all that stuff. And it's like, I feel like the promoters these days just don't put in the footwork. Yeah. Well, yeah. The ones that do stand out and they For succeed sure. very quickly and rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, it, so I assume that's the approach you take. I mean, I know you go to a lot of shows. Like, you're always out and shit. Yeah. More How so, exhausting is yeah, that? Yeah, dude. It's <laughs> going to, coming back at two or three and then getting up at seven or eight and trying to be focused every day, it catches up to you. But I actually don't really go out on Fridays or Saturdays, one or the other, mainly because that's when there's other. I don't know. I, I like to go out Sunday through Thursday. Usually right. those are like when musicians go out or like you run into people that are about nightlife and they're not just tired of their nine to five and they need to go and release stress. Yeah. You know, there's a lot more violence happening on Fridays and Saturdays at bars than unless it's a really dope ass show or festival, but like bar scene, I don't, it's yeah. hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we take, for example, like even like the continental room in downtown Fullerton yeah. or like, and like just as downtown Fullerton in general, like fr Fridays and Saturdays, Versus a Monday or Tuesday, different people. Yeah. You know? Well, and it's cool that, that even on a Monday or Tuesday, it does well. It fares pretty well. Yeah. Usually the show's out yeah. there. Well, Mondays are pretty popping everywhere now. Just a lot of uh, bars, even in LA, do their residencies or their free shows in yeah. Echo Park. So that's that's the night to go out. Why don't these people have jobs? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they Who do. Goes they, out just, on a Monday night? they just don't give a fuck. <laughs> Uh, do, what do you do you uh, work full time as well or are you just um i book mostly that's like mm. my main that's my main gig uh, right. i do i did start uh selling insurance niche i started a niche with concert venues film like people that you know independent businesses like videographers that have twenty thirty thousand dollars in equipment you know mm. i just help them out and write a policy i used to i used to sell auto and home insurance and i stopped doing that and i just started focusing on working with musicians even though it's still insurance at, at least is something that is music or entertainment related mm. you know and i just do that on and off if i setting up appointments here and there but most my most of my day is booking and trying to find new clients right on yeah i mean What's I I know you went to. Uh, I mean I know you went to China with Moon Ensemble, mm -hmm. and Brandon hates talking about China. But what he was barely even there. I know he was. <laughs> <laughs> was <laughs> but I mean that was an I'll, experience. Yeah, I want to get your perspective on that. Oh like, man, well I'll start off by saying I I fucked up, by <laughs> like mm -hmm. day one type shit. Like we missed our flight. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Mike told me that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, if you get John here, it's all his fault. Not sure. No, it, I mean, it, it is. It is. Like, I thought it was 1 p.m. And my dumbass, like, since that since that day, all my clocks are military time. Like, that shit. <laughs> I was just like, I don't know why. Because, like, the entire itinerary is in Mandarin. And mm. then you just see numbers. So I'm like, okay, I'm assuming this is, like, 1 o'clock. That's when we leave. Because it's at LAX, too. Beijing but that like everything else was in Mandarin so I'm just like fuck I don't I don't know what this <laughs> is but I mean okay other than that we got there safely um and getting to the festival we had a translator but the translator sometimes wasn't always available and there was constant technical difficulties and mm. so I think that six weeks of every single day something was fucking up what just taught us to be patient like there's no way that any show here could go as wrong where you're like trying to talk to the sound guy and the sound guy one doesn't speak english two is looking at his phone so you're like trying to get his attention while you're performing so there is parts there was like in the first three so the first three weeks me uh gil and mike made up a set to we played random shit we played Jeez. uh two of gil's original songs so there was like bluesy rock type songs and it was just guitar drums and keys i'm not the best keyboardist let's just, <laughs> let's just leave, say that um and we play like a fat boy slim song and like a daft punk song um with the limited instruments that we had Jesus. um and so there was like some sets because we played three sets a day and some sets 
um, in the middle of the set, my keyboard just went out. It was like if the sound guy was like, this guy fucking sucks. Like, just fuck this guy. Like, <laughs> Mute. My bad. I already broke rule number one. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like my keyboard was not playing. So I'm just like playing keys. Nothing's coming out. And I just have to like go with it. I can't just be like, fuck this. I'm walking off stage, you know, because there's a lot of people there. It was like anywhere from maybe 150 at the least to like four or five hundred people um, maybe more um but yeah so there was a couple of those times where my keyboard just wasn't nothing was coming out of my keyboard and i just had to pretend like i was just like and is that your first time i mean you said you you basically learned in college how to play yeah that was my first time performing on a keyboard i dj huh. a lot but yeah. other than that like that was my first time playing Keys, like a live like instrument a live, yeah like, yeah for with other music well no actually I, I mean i was in an ensemble in college which mm. i was playing keyboard too that was with like 12 other people but outside of school yeah that was my first and you're in a foreign country did you shit your pants literally no mike did though yeah i <laughs> just kidding <laughs> <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> Uh, that's fucking insane dude. yeah but it was dope dude i think like if i were to i think the opportunity's still there mm -hmm. um and i would go back i don't know about six weeks probably go for like three weeks but like, all right dudes you guys are all good settled cool i'm i'm gonna go back nice but yeah it was it was cool it was cool that moon and sama get to play originals yeah. they wanted cover. like covers yeah right? they wanted yeah. just basically american cover bands and our agreement with with the promoter or the festival coordinator was that we would play our originals to kind of bring an L.A. sound to China, which Moon Ensemble is representing Los Angeles now in China. Yeah. You know, so it was cool. It was it was cool. The fun thing was that what we got to do after the festival, I mean, it was uh, $2 shots type of thing. So, nice. I mean, I didn't go out as often as these dudes did, but... <laughs> Fuck, dude. Uh, you're like waking up at 3 a.m you're like where are these <laughs> yeah that was a big controversy actually for a long time yeah. um so there's three of us and there was two rooms available in the first three weeks and so one of them was a one bed and the other one was two beds and so there was a battle royale of who, <laughs> who gets the one bed <laughs> <laughs> And you're like, well, you guys are going to party, so I'm going to get the one bed, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, dude, China was dope. I think I'd recommend, I just recommend touring in general for bands, just to kind of get the hang of things. Mm -hmm. uh, hang of basic shit, like arriving on time, sound checking. Yeah. You know, playing your set at, you know, starting and ending at the fucking designated time. Things like that. And you've, you've booked tours. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I think one of the biggest problems that I think most bands have is like, it seems almost impossible. Like nobody knows where to turn. I mean, for the, for the younger bands, you know, mm -hmm. they don't know, which we assume that some of them are watching. So it's like, what advice do you have on, on like booking a tour? Google maps, do your fucking research. <laughs> Honestly, like that's my friend, Google maps. So I will give a little, I don't even know if it's a trick. It's just a fucking feature in Google maps. You can mm -hmm. star places and heart and flag and create lists in google maps mm -hmm. so if you type in music venue in a certain city you're gonna get all the main venues now there's like hidden spots and stuff like that that you have to dig a little deeper but if you're just looking for your echo hi-hat type of venues like your formal ones yeah. they're all gonna pop up you know if you do your google search because mm -hmm. they all register their they want to be found so they're gonna you know register their venue on the internet but if you plan it I would just say start small. If you're in LA or Orange County or anywhere in this area, just play in fucking California and anywhere that you can drive five hours or less. Yeah. So maybe Phoenix and make friends. Honestly, like a lot of bands, even if they go on tour, they show up right before the show, play their set and dip. And it's yeah. like, dude, you didn't make, you're disrespecting a lot of people by doing that just by, you're disrespecting the venue that is giving you uh, space to share your art um, just by showing up playing and leaving you're not spending money there which mm. isn't you know required but just sticking around means a lot to the staff there and if you stick around to the other bands and at least kind of have a five to ten minute conversation with them they'll remember you a little bit so if next time you go around you have friends in a city 
Yeah. Because if you go on a tour once, and obviously you're probably going to break even at best or lose money, um, at least if you maintain some relationships, then I think it was worth it. But it's starting out. <laughs> I think you have to get your own shit together, like, first before you even think. And by that, I mean, like, your music has to be on Spotify. You know, mm -hmm. you have to have some press shots. You have to have a press release or at least a bio. Some people's bios are like, they're pretty, they're pretty terrible. Yeah. I was talking shit. I forgot who it was. I mean, I don't know who the band was, but I always see these, these like bios that are just like, they sound like, like fantasy porn or some shit like that. You know, they're like, like three people from, southern los angeles getting together to create a wave of blah 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 that the ethos and blah 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 and the atmosphere i'm like full i don't want to book you on principle like fuck you dude like how self-important to what degree do i have to participate in your yeah. self-importance <laughs> i think it's fucking ridiculous but yeah well i think one thing that i would advise against is do not buy followers do, do right? not okay. buy followers because like I'll because bands will hit me up they're like yo you know we're looking for a booking agent we're looking to tour etc and I look on their Instagram and because like, that's usually where they reach out from I'm like oh wow you got like 6,000 followers that's cool um, no verified check mark but that's okay maybe you know whatever you go on their Facebook and it's like also like a couple thousand you're like okay you know this band has been around for a while and you go to Spotify and they're less than a thousand streams and SoundCloud less than 500 plays and you're like what the fuck how do you have like 10,000 followers and less than a thousand streams on Spotify it doesn't it doesn't really make sense yeah um, I'm sure there's a way you can find like or if you just click on their followers and there's just like no profile pictures it's just yeah. scrolling down and you're <laughs> like come on dude so I think as a, if a venue sees that I think they almost are offended and won't book you yeah um, it's like you're lying to me right did you hear about that band that like built a fake online I saw like a, a like a bait like a, like a, a, clickbait, type, thing, a clickbait yeah. thing and I didn't want to like indulge in that but tell me more about that I, I saw the same thing but I just assumed and who was telling me about it? were you telling me about it no what are you talking about? Oh, someone was talking about it. Who cares? They're dead. Someone who like booked but, a fake tour or like no, they booked a tour based on a fake audience. So I don't know what they did to get this fake audience, but they booked an entire tour off of that. And every show they played, there was no one there. And it's insane, which I thought was kind of like one of the coolest, like trolling things you could do because it's like, why aren't these venues doing their research? Yeah. Or I mean, if you did it to win over the venue and you get your, and you get your date locked in and mm. you, I don't know, but like there are no other support bands. Like I don't get that. Like if they did like, Oh, we can headline this whole fucking tour. But like after you get the date, do you not promote it at all? That's See, fucked up. Cause I think like, yeah. even if you, if you lied about how many people you could bring, but you still like, they just offered you a door deal and you promoted after the fact and you brought like 50 people maybe they would be like okay like whatever it was just a bad show but if there was less than 50 people at every single one of your shows and you're like yeah we have like 10,000 listeners uh in seattle so we want to book like this big ass venue and yeah that sucks it, it's fucked up but it's that, like, because he, at that point you're wasting the venue's time you're wasting the venue's money mm -hmm. and you're kind of wasting your own fucking money like what's what's the gain from that right. you know it's like no one's gonna fucking hear you you know, you're not getting paid because you're not getting the fucking bar deal. They took the phrase fake it till you make it way too seriously. Way too serious, <laughs> dude. But I think it's at the same time it's kind of hilarious and that something like that can happen yeah. in today's climate. Yeah, yeah, I don't I'll look into that. I wanna yeah. see I wanna do a little more research in that and see what the <laughs> fuck happened. I know I probably shouldn't have brought it up without reading the article. God damn it, Dish. <laughs> 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 this is all your fault. That's right. Uh, so with all that stuff, I mean, I think one of the biggest problems that also a lot of bands have is like their emails. You know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, let me. What kind of emails are you getting, and what kind of emails do you like frown upon? And versus like, okay, if you have to send an email to book a tour to a fucking club and all that stuff, mm -hmm. what are your? It depends on the relationship. And it depends on every person thinks differently and expects 
emails differently. So you, it's not like it's not like a resume. It's like kind of like a resume when you when you're asking a venue to book a show. Mm-hmm. You can't just have this one template and send it out to twenty venues and expect that all of them are going to react the same. Mm-hmm. Some people like some venues want a sentence and a link, and they're mm-hmm. like, "I'll figure if if you're dope, I would know about you. If you're not, then don't waste my time." Other ones want like your full bio, all this, all your links, a press photo attached, your EPK, like all kinds of shit. So I think maybe be overprepared than underprepared as far as that goes, but be professional, approach people. I don't, you don't even need proper grammar and emails to be quite honest. Um, just get your point across and don't try and deceive. I guess what's funny is I've been approached by other booking agents and like, they're like, yo, this is like the best band to come out of 2000. 18 and blah 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 and they're like really hyping up their band yeah. like this is unnecessary dude like <laughs> you don't need to tell me like this is like the hottest new band coming out of austin texas yeah you know but um frowned upon i don't know i honestly frowned upon is if you're doing email you're already doing the right thing yeah frowned upon is like hitting me up on twitter or like on instagram and just be like yo anytime you need a show hit me up <laughs> like, <laughs> sick dude it's like for hit me up for real like <laughs> if you if you did your homework if you actually looked at my page you know where my email was. like if you went on my page it says inquiries and there's an email right there like just, <laughs> you could have sent that exact same message on email and i probably would read it i would probably think of you a lot better i don't know why but, no you know? i mean it's it's a thing because it's like it just shows that they didn't look. Yeah. They didn't look. They just kind of scroll through the pictures like, oh, he seems to know what he's doing. DM. Yeah. DM, it. I just like respond with the heart. <laughs> <laughs> like love. Yeah. It's better than a fuck you. But <laughs> just switch it up. Huh? Yeah, just... dude. Just send the middle finger emoji. <laughs> That's all you gotta do. <laughs> or apparently Ellen has an emoji. You know Ellen has an emoji? She has an emoji. Really? Yeah. So wow. Send the Ellen emoji. How would you send an email? How would I send an email? Yeah. But like, uh, first dick pic. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Then. Oh man. You know, videos like the new thing now. You should probably do a video. Yeah, I mean, I would. It's just you know, you can get a lot. You can get away with a lot more in a picture as far as making things look longer than you can in a video. Mm. You know, right. it's like if I uh, if I'm gonna send a video, I have to get like a wide angle lens extension to put on my shit, and then <laughs> it's like then it looks like it's three inches as opposed to one and a half. But I have a tiny penis; it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> um, I'm immature. That's a thing that we, we all are. Yeah, aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I don't know how to send an email. I, I I stopped sending emails because one of my buddies, who I was working with, um. He was like, <laughs> he would look at our emails and be like, fool, you wrote a fucking novel. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know? I, I had to be in a good mood and like taking a shit and be like, <laughs> oh shit, I, I can like read this real quick. But if I'm like actually working and someone sends me this, I'm like, next. Yeah. Like, it know. sucks dude, because I'm the type of guy who's like, I'm always apologetic to some degree. I mean, I'm, I'm very unapologetic in my personality, but when it comes to like, Hey man, so I'm trying to be the real guy in the emails and it's like, yeah, yeah dude, no, it's like, I mean, I like what you guys do and blah, blah, blah. And I'll fucking write this whole thing about why I'm not, I don't even know what the fuck I'm doing half the time. I'm just writing an email. Like I get into the, I'm doing this for business purposes and then so the other day, you know, my <laughs> girlfriend was pissed off at me and like, <laughs> I'll just get into this stupid personal shit. And, no, I won't actually do that. But actually, I think I do have some good advice. I just kind of sprung up on my head. You had to don't make the talent buyer. In other words, the person who's confirming the shows at the venue, don't make them do any work. Yeah. They don't want to do work. Yeah. They, they have they have thousands of they, emails. They have and- 365 days a year that they need to fill with music and at least three bands per show that's over a thousand bands that they need to book in their venue a year and if you're reaching out you know and saying hey we're looking to do something like you're being extremely ambiguous and saying we need looking to do something in january through march um just us we don't really have support you know if you have any available dates let me know like that doesn't 
say anything yeah. if you're like hey we're looking for these dates and you give them four or five specific dates we have these two local bands we want our tickets to be eight or ten dollars you know eight dollar advance ten dollars at the door and you're giving them the whole like basically all they have to do is look and type this shit into ticket web and if if that's all they have to do and they like the lineup because they know the bands that are playing and it fits their programming your chances of getting the show is like a thousand percent higher than than just like what I just said, like, oh, you know, we're looking, we're like releasing an EP in like six months, you know, yeah. it's like, we don't really have a demo yet. We're, we're still recording, but like, it's like, you know, then why are you looking for shows? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no one's that, just going to show up. That's the thing is like, don't a lot of, a lot of bands tell me like, we're, we're, we're currently recording something. Mm -hmm. See, I don't want to know what you're doing. Just tell me once it's done. Yeah. and be like okay this is done and we have here's the here it's all mastered but we're not going to release it until you know this day and we're looking to have a show and we already have everything already planned out mm -hmm. and then at that point if you can do that in like less than 100 words or 200 words you're <laughs> golden you're fucking gold there you yeah. go you heard it exclusive yeah don't fucking look for sh you're not going to jump ahead of anything <laughs> if you ain't got shit done <laughs> Yeah. get the shit it takes hard work to get the shit done and once you get the shit done it takes hard work to get it out yeah don't don't be too quick to release you know there's really no difference between releasing something in january and releasing it in march no other than there's seasons you know in festivals and if you're gonna work around that then yeah but if you just finish recording and then you're like yo like we just finished mastering this let's put a ep release show in two weeks mm -hmm. you're giving yourself two weeks to promote something that took you a year and a half to do you yeah. know, give like give yourself a little bit of a break to promote that kind of shit. Legit. But yeah. Anyway. All good advice. All, I mean, Look at you. This is why you're you. I I <laughs> fuck dude, I spent like <laughs> six and like nine months after I graduated college, I quit my jobs. I was working for I was like refereeing on the weekend soccer and I was like working for Bose, the sound company, and I just quit all of it and just like I said, Google Maps. And just like <laughs> fucking Instagram, Google Maps, like for like six months, did nothing but do that and send emails and get no responses. I think I was sending like at least a hundred emails a day and maybe get like two responses. Mm -hmm. And those two were denials. They were mm -hmm. just like not interested, you know, until, and I remember looking at myself, I was like, one day you're going to have way too many fucking emails to answer. And then that day came and then shit's not like that anymore. I got to get back to that. But yeah. it goes in phases. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Everything comes in waves for sure. So I want to know, because you seem to have a good head on your shoulders. It's a cute one. Thanks. I like you it. You too. It's like symmetrically nice. It's Really? I like the way your glasses fit. Thanks. I like your hat. It's real cute. Yeah. It reminds me of like Smalls from the Sandlot kind of hat. It's the same color and everything. <laughs> it's like you're the guy who's like, kind of like he wants to play with the bigger kids and like they're not sure if he's cool or not <laughs> oh, fuck. but uh no i mean what is it what is it exactly that i mean what got you into even wanting to pursue music at all or be having anything to do with music what made you want to take that major in college and all that damn dude, i think it, uh, i can attribute all of it to electronic music like uh when i started i started djing in like the sixth grade djing top 40 like little john at too short and sierra <laughs> and missy elliott <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> shit, shit like that you know for a junior high valentine's dance and then what dude, the fuck I'm is the fucking <laughs> ice cream man doing gonna say this fool is slanging dude there's no ice cream in that shit <laughs> ice cream truck just passed by it's like 10 okay, o'clock at night okay. 10 o'clock at night in fucking November <laughs> in La Puente. Fool. That fool's got <laughs> that fool's got ice <laughs> no, no cream. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> oh, fuck. Uh, Sorry. So you attribute all your musical passion to Lil John. <laughs> <laughs> the East Side Boys, yeah. That's what's no, up. No, dude, then like after that, uh, my cousin was DJing uh, house music. He had like old school CDJs and he introduced me to like Fetty Legrand and like Benny Benazi and like all these like 90s DJs, Felix mm. the House Cat and stuff. And so I wanted to be a fucking EDM producer DJ. And I'm like, okay, DJs, the only way DJs make it is by producing their own music. 
and mm-hmm. I don't know I don't know how to play piano. All I do is mix. So I went to me. I took some classes. I dropped out of uh, varsity soccer because I'm like, okay, I can't do both because var- soccer was like 6 a.m. to fucking 6 p.m. And so I'm like, okay, I need to decide what I want to do. And so I chose music and took a couple classes at a studio and piano. And then went to music program at Cal Poly and then learned there that, I don't know, I think I, I think it was, I really gave in to limiting beliefs that I couldn't produce music or I wasn't going to be successful in that mm-hmm. and just pursued another option and still being and working in music. And then at that point, I'm just like, I'm already too deep. I can't fucking like flip flop back to it i think i was i would still love to produce something mm-hmm. um but yeah that's kind of how i got into it just kind of one thing after another all right on. so with all that i mean you coming from the electronic background music like how is i mean how is as you project as you perfect yeah how did you perfect, and also drugs <laughs> how did i go from like edm music to like, like band? producing bands yeah yeah or like just like promoting bands and booking bands and all that shit like. i think i tried to like do it like i tried to put myself in like club scenes as a dj and like electronic scene just seemed like way too controlled it just seemed like the players in that game were they the independents were just far and few in between and i feel like working with bands seems a little bit more attainable mm-hmm. and so plus the cal poly there was like one other dude that dj'd and there was like everyone else was in a fucking band yeah and so i was like oh, well i'll just you know i just like check this shit out honestly i going even going to college like i didn't listen to i didn't grow up with like a lot of these bands that people i work with now grew up listening to mm-hmm. like our music but now i listen to it just because well, now I listen to a lot of different shit, but... So that's good. It kind of expanded your horizons a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I put myself in in situations I don't think I normally would have if I was just focused on DJing. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, with all with all of that stuff, I mean, you coming from kind of a top 40 kind of background and, you know, wanting to be electronic, you know, producer and all that stuff, it's like... And, I mean, you kind of see how everything's going. I mean, if you look at what is what is making money in this industry like the live band stuff is like it's it's low dude i mean it's like it's like it's a, it's kind of officially underground you know <laughs> yeah there's people doing it right though there's there's people like definitely i think you just have to set expectations and and like how what is your definition of success in music and that's the question i ask everybody that i come across or as a musician like you're not going to be like you're not going to be beyonce it's just like any other industry like do you think you're going to be a fortune 500 company if you start something maybe you could be an amazon but it's the same thing with bands you know Mm. you are you cool with making like 50 grand a year after everything off of your music each person in the band and that's a pretty successful band to make like 200 g's a year um, and if you're cool with that, then, and you're happy with that, then that should, that everything else should, you know, shouldn't matter. Yeah. You know, and so if, if that's, when you're looking at it like that, those goals don't seem too far fetched to like attain, to like accomplish, mm-hmm. you know, to make $10,000 to start off in a year. It's not, that's not that hard. You know, you just kind of have to do that rather than being like, how do I make a million dollars? You know, and trying to do that. What are you worth right now? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Minus seven thousand dollars. That's what's up. No, I, I'm glad you you said. Uh, I'm glad you brought up redefining what success means because for us that's always been kind of a a huge thing that not something that we want to impart on anyone, but it's something that I think we've all kind of like everyone in the collective's kind of figured out collectively. Is that see what I did there? Uh, Brandon liked it. Um, <laughs> Richard, you look so hot, dude. Look at your rings and shit. Fuck. Fuck. Anyway, I'm getting flustered. I know, me too. (laughs) No, is that like, you know, we had to really redefine success, period. You know, it's like to where it's like, 
monetary success doesn't define success now mm -hmm. you know it's like what are we doing this for did we start making the music to make money did we start making the music because we needed to because it helped us in our fucking personal lives or anything like that you yeah. know and i think that that's a huge thing that people have to look at and it it, it, it kind of starts to blur the lines a little bit of of everything when when you're trying to get it heard especially mm -hmm. you know because you're like well okay i know in order to consider myself successful what, what do I consider success? Okay, I might have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I have a full-time job, but I have a passion for making music. And I will work this fucking job, and I will take all this money, and I will put it into my music. I will buy equipment. I will do all that stuff. I'll f pay for recording or all that shit. I'll do this, and I will s spend many sleepless nights working on this stuff and running on two hours of sleep at my 9 to 5, and that I consider successful because... I'm doing what I love at the end of the fucking day, yeah. you know, but with all that, I think the lines really get fucking blurred when it's like, well, now it's time. Can, can I be heard? And can that help me with my monetary success and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. And then it starts to get like really fucking difficult as far as like, how the fuck do I do it? No. I, I think though, like a lot, I do give credit to a lot of people that actually do go through with a, a recording and put it out. I know so many musicians that play an instrument and they're like, yeah, you don't want to do this artist thing, but you know, I have this job and there's just like excuses and after excuses and they never get around to it. So I think for the people that go through and go through with the, all the steps of songwriting, arranging, recording, fucking publishing and distributing it and even fucking playing shows and booking like that's success you're doing it yeah you know and then how well you know people receive it and how much money you're making i think that's just like a that's just a result but the success is you doing all of those things yeah because it's hard for like uh i mean if i go to a show and one of my friends that's playing a show has a friend that goes and introduces me to him or her and um they're telling me like oh you know i also make music too but like i'm like cool like do you have a sound clothing they're like yeah but i'm like too afraid to like show people i'm like so do you want to make like what do you want to do like <laughs> what what do you want to do with your life i want to make music i want to perform music i want to be on stage it's like okay well then show me like do, do you mind like showing me a snippet or singing 30 seconds of of something they're like <sighs> I don't know. I don't think it's ready yet. You're like, dude, what the fuck? Like, if you want to be on stage and you're afraid to perform, like, you got some issues. Like, uh, you got some shit to work out, you know? Or even, like, release, even just making music. And if you want to make music for yourself, that's cool. But if you want to make music... And perform it and all that. Yeah, I mean... So everyone that's... Get making, over that shit. Everyone that's making music, everyone that's playing shows and releasing shit, like, props. Because there's a lot of people that give into fear and don't do anything. Yeah. I guess myself included. Straight up, yeah, man. Straight up. I mean, I used to fucking. I think for years I would throw up before every show, which ruined my vocals. But really? Every show, dude. It didn't matter. Like every fucking show, I would have a. I would have a show at like Silver Lake Lounge, like years ago or some shit like that, and I knew no one was gonna be there, but it's still I'd be like in the restroom going, uh, Dad doesn't love me. <laughs> but, uh, I'd be, flashbacks. Yeah, flashback. Ah, ah. Uh, <laughs> I'd just be thrown up before every fucking show, but it's like it, it becomes one of those things where it's like, dude, at some point, like you're here. It, it's I think it's harder for solo artists. Yeah. For sure, because I mean, unless they have like someone they're paying to like be their backing band and all this stuff. Like for bands, for, it's like there's kind of no excuse to get out of that fucking garage. You know, it's like you got you got boys fucking who have your back and want to go up there just as bad as you do and all that shit. So yeah, I didn't learn that shit. But yeah, no, fuck people. Also you, drugs. Also drugs. <laughs> I say drugs and he fucking fucking lifts his head up. <laughs> He's like on Tinder. He's like drugs. <laughs> <laughs> He's like. Fuck fucking. Actually on drugs.com. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the dark web buying. Uh, he actually flaca. He actually called that ice cream truck. <laughs> I know he did. <laughs> you must go get that ice with no cream. What's mm -hmm. up, Brandon? Actually, even like this podcast that you started, that's dope. I mean, a lot of people are like let's start a fucking podcast. Let's start a YouTube channel. Like I want to start a YouTube channel too. Kind of breaking down the 
the myth the myth of like booking a tour and showing people how e like it's not easy but like how plausible it is to actually go through and, and do it yourself that's important that's like seriously important information that i wish i had give yeah. me your first tutorial yeah yeah exactly but the fact that you have people here and you set it up and everything that's that's dope you you have will and you can push you can think of something creatively and then go through with it 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 also helps that we're all in our last leg here and we're 30 years old and we're like, we can't be playing bar shows forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all desperate. That's why we're here. <laughs> but that desperation, you know, it really brings people together. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this is the least inspiring fucking thing you ever done. Just get to a point where you're so desperate and nothing else is working and get all the other sad fucks around you and just try to make something with it. Yeah. Or maybe it's great advice. You know what? PJ gave me the look. It's great advice. It's good. I like it. <laughs> so what? you're gonna do a YouTube channel. Yeah, you're gonna be like one of the first people on it. Oh yeah. Yeah, dude. Tight. It's gonna you know there's always like so many different youtube channels they're like oh this one's like performance based and you watch bands like play and then interview so i'm still at crossroads with that being like another youtube channel how do you what do you think like this podcast is different than other podcasts well i mean you have a lot of and here's and one thing i had to learn about the the podcast game right off the bat was that like you can't look at other podcasts as competition Mm -hmm. like it's not that like i think podcast the thing i love about podcasts is like it's it's the new form of pirate radio mm -hmm. so anyone doing it anyone who has the balls to do it even if they're not great at it or whatever the fuck it is it's cool and it's like it's a great tool to have other people on podcasts on your podcast you know it's all that. it's just a great cross promotion web i love it but one thing i like here that you know we have a lot of musicians and, and actors and artists on stuff on here and I love it because I don't actually showcase their talent on this thing. My whole goal is to get to know them as people, get the audience cur curious, and yeah. then have them go check it out. Check it out because I feel like it's it's more personal. You know, it's like yeah. you really some uh, some someday I'll have someone's. I probably already have. I, I'll have someone's favorite artist on this fucking thing. I've had a lot of amazing people on here. And anyone who's part of their first thousand fan base is going to fucking love the fact that they got to know them a little bit. Yeah. You know, and we're starting live sessions. I'm making that announcement. Oh, they should be out by the time this one comes out. Yeah, we're doing live sessions now with bands. So we're having some of the bands that have performed on here. We're doing a video as well. So it's like you can get to know who they are and then check out the, the so music. Is the, is the live feed going to be their performance? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be the interview and the people can like ask questions? Well, this is, I mean, I call it live sessions. Um, think about it like, Oh, live, right. Like okay, okay. Radiohead live yeah, from the basement. Yeah. yeah, shit. yeah. Gotcha. So it's a, it's a performance video. So we're doing that and it's like, either they'll see the performance video and if they want to get to know more about them, they can check out the podcast that's dope. or they heard the podcast and they can go check them out immediately after. Yeah. That's cool. That's the whole goal here. But I have a lot of creative friends and that's the whole thing about it's yeah. just trying to build a platform so that they get recognized for it you know you too buddy yeah man i like you you too <laughs> we should get to know each other more i agree yeah yeah we should date we should fuck <laughs> <laughs> cameras are gonna shut off or will they <laughs> i don't know we got a whole audience right here <laughs> We'll just turn this into a fucking Andy Warhol party. Oh shit! Warhol. Warhol. That's I mean you have Warhol. you have jelly and head in the same. I mean, oh. I mean, come on. There's there's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what comes out of the head. I said it. You, you drinking my coffee, you son of a bitch? I'm just kidding. I finished it. I think. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, man. But yeah, dude. I think we should get to know each other more. Yeah. I think we have mutual interests that we should link up mm -hmm. and just take each other's pants off with our teeth. One day. <laughs> <laughs> I have to like really uncomfortably like just like hit on every male guest. I don't know what it is, but. Do you feel as comfortable hitting on female guests? No. 
<laughs> Why not? Because they're not as pretty to me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I just like hairy penis. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> My girlfriend is asking herself so many questions right now. She's like, I fucking knew it, dude. I fucking knew it. But, uh, yeah. I appreciate you coming on here. Yeah, man. Me too. And I'm glad to be here. It was very informative. Um, I support Cielo. Do you? No. Wholeheartedly. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. Do you have any other questions? I have How questions. big are your shoes? Oh, my shoes? Yeah. Well, some days are like nine. Some days are like ten and a half. That's what's up. Yeah. <laughs> what are your questions? You have questions for me? What are your questions? Yeah, dude. I, I actually really like your project, uh, Porcelain Pale. Oh, thank so, you. So um, I'm interested in knowing when you have more music. We are working on that. We plan on... We're, we're writing a full length. We have a weird thing. It's kind of secret, but... <laughs> <laughs> no we're working on stuff we're, we're doing a full length album right now that hopefully if enough people give a shit about this they'll give a shit about that yeah but um if not you know whatever the point is that we did it yeah exactly that's yeah. exactly uh you know we had to, we had to change it up a lot you know getting a new drummer and then max is no longer a bassist so you know he's focusing on wires which we support him wholeheartedly wires is the shit if you haven't seen you've seen wires yeah. right yeah fucking amazing fucking love him but uh yeah, so we're we're figuring everything out right now. It's just PJ Adrian and I writing a bunch of stuff. I'm picking up bass live again. Actually Adrian and I are gonna be switching off. We're gonna be playing all kinds of instruments on stage, doing the Bugs Bunny on first, Bugs Bunny on second whole thing. And then taking a left to Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me know. Yeah. S send over those like private SoundCloud links. Oh hell yeah. Yeah. You know what's up. There's actually one song I remember uh, when I first met you guys. There was one song that you guys had on SoundCloud. I literally like after listening to it, I just like press back and like listen to it. this one song like fucking over and over again. I don't know. So I had this vibe. What song was it? He has no idea. I have no idea. Put him on blast. Fuck. <laughs> I mean, if I no, but there's like if I went on your SoundCloud and like played it, it it's a very it's there's only one song that made me feel that way. All right. And I'll be honest, like no, just, hey, like that good. one song. But that's all. If it, if one song did it, uh, yeah, but yeah, I'm curious. I really liked your guys' sound, and I'd love to see you guys continue. Yeah, and, no, and, sure. yeah, because a lot of bands. I mean, that's the game. It's not even like how much you can do. It's just fucking how long can you last? Yeah. Because after, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I set myself up. <laughs> <laughs> Four or five minutes. <laughs> if I'm lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> I think I pinched my leg really hard. Uh, mm. That's a trick? That's a trick. You got to tell me really? tricks. You got to no. tell me these tricks. You gotta, <laughs> dude, you're like that. You just think of your dad. Oh, that gets me harder. <laughs> that gets me harder too. <laughs> it's weird. No, it's fine. <laughs> that was pretty low. Yeah. Yeah, my dad's a midget. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> we gotta end on a better note than that. <laughs> but thank you for your support. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yes, we should get together and do stuff. What do you do? Where do you go out? Like, where is your um, comfortable bar to hang out at? <sighs> Dude, I don't hang out anywhere. I'm working. <laughs> always i'm so working so fucking this is always. your comfortable bar this is my comfortable bar i okay. get beer and i drink here and i work Dope. i'm a workaholic there's no fun well you live close to a lot of people that i visit frequently so it won't be difficult to stop by. you're out there and no. or where do you think i'm at now because i've moved wait you don't live here i don't live here anymore what the fuck uh, oh I, I will be i'll be moving here in february so yeah oh here. really yeah where do you live right now corona oh fuck. riverside almost. yeah oh shit never mind yeah <laughs> i don't go out there <laughs> yeah <laughs> you don't need to there's nothing <laughs> happening there dude but uh well brandon if you're huh? huh he disagrees oh no there isn't uh, I I mean, there brandon's isn't. They trying to start a, a scene in lake paris right now that's what's up yeah, that's dude. where pj's at pj likes to party in large groups of one. Oh, yeah <laughs> 
But yeah, man. We'll link up and shit. But yeah, I'm out here. Cool. Yeah. We'll do the damn thing. Let's do it. All right, man. Well, thank you for coming on this podcast. Yeah, man. Thanks dude. for having me on. Pleasure. Finally got to talk to you. Yeah. I'm happy with it. So... <laughs> <laughs>